this episode of Market Movers, we're going to dive into the outlook for the U.S. economy and the Fed. Since the Fed's last meeting in July, inflation has continued to moderate and economic data have proved resilient, raising hopes for a soft landing. Meanwhile, stock markets have continued to fare much better than last year, with investor sentiment resembling the start of a new bull market rather than a temporary one, with the clouds of recession still looming. For investors, many questions remain before we can call an all-clear in the economic outlook. To answer some of these, I'm very glad to be joined today by Mike Faroli, uh, Chief Economist uh, for the J.P. Morgan Corporate Investment Bank. Let's get started. Mike, welcome to Insights Now. Thank you. Good to be here. So let's start with the economy overall. Uh, I mean, over the last year, a lot of people have been predicting a recession, and yet the economy has proven very resilient. So yeah. why do you think we're still growing? Yeah. So um, a couple of things. First of all, before we you know, sound the all clear, the Fed really just got very aggressive last summer, so about a year ago. So we should still consider that the lags may kick in and uh, and tip the economy into recession. So we don't want to be too uh, you know, confident here about things. Now, that being said, third quarter growth is holding in very well. So it doesn't feel like we're on the precipice of a recession, even even a little over a year after the Fed got very aggressive. So, so why is the economy, to your point, why is it, why is it uh, exhibited such resilience? I think there could be a few things. One is that the fiscal support uh, has probably been greater than we were anticipating about a year ago, uh, and we're seeing that in a number of dimensions. But when you look at the uh, fiscal deficit on a cash flow basis, it looks like it widened about three percentage points over going from 22 to 23. So that may have offset a lot of the monetary tightening we've seen. I think another thing perhaps is, particularly when we look at the labor market, is that some of the post-pandemic normalization, which was always going to be difficult to calibrate correctly because we've never had a global pandemic in the modern era, uh, some of that post-pandemic normalization seems to have uh, still have legs. So when we saw last um, Friday's uh, jobs report for August, where you see continued strength is in sectors that still have not recovered employment gains to where they should be mm -hmm. uh, by this point. So healthcare would be an obvious one. Still seeing some of that in things like leisure and hospitality. So some of that tailwind from the, the reopening, which you know, will, has been fading, will continue to fade. It's just fading a little slower, perhaps, than we thought. And, and a lot of that is going to be, I think, uh, uh, not too responsive to monetary policy. Certainly, healthcare is probably one of the least sure. interest-sensitive sectors you can think about. So I think those are a couple of reasons why uh, things are holding in better than, certainly, than we expected. So holding in better than... Uh, we expected, but still, you know, every quarter is a new quarter. So how long does our luck hold out? How long <laughs> do we go before, I suppose, the cumulative probability of entering a recession exceeds 50 percent? Yeah. So that's a, a, a tough question. Um, you know, right now we're, you know, we're about in the third year of this expansion. So by uh, certainly the standards of the last three quite long expansions, uh, this is, still looks like a young expansion. Right. So by that metric, simply looking at time, you'd say we have a way to go. Um, on the other hand, when you look at how tight labor markets are, when you look at arguably the corporate profit margin cycle is kind of rolling over, these things would suggest we're late cycle, even though we're only three years in. Um, so I would I would tend to lean a little more toward the latter. I, you know, we'd, I wouldn't want to put a precise number uh, or date on it. Right now, we're not expecting a recession next year, though we do think recession risks remain pretty elevated, in part because we don't know if we've seen the full extent of the monetary tightening that's already been in place. But right now, uh, we don't have a firm date on when we're looking and, for a recession. And I think, you know, to your point about maybe you don't want to just go chronologically on how long expansions mm -hmm. last. I mean, the, you know, the last long expansion was one in which the unemployment rate came down very slowly. So it mm -hmm. took us years to get to full employment, whereas right now we're we've below 4 percent. We've been below 4 percent for a year. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, we, we are, I think, by most people's measures, at full employment right now. Right. It certainly wasn't the case for most of the time yeah. in, the, in the last long expansion. Um, okay, so th that's where we are in terms of economic growth. So okay so far, but, the, but there's, you know, the, the eventually there are, you know, there are dangers of falling into recession. H how about Inflation. I mean, it, it, the Fed seems so fixated on we've got to get to 2% inflation before the pandemic. Obviously got, obviously got much higher than that last year. Mm -hmm. has been coming down. Do you think this is a residual inflation problem or will we actually be able to get down to that 2% number? So I think 
Uh, first of all, I would say for the Fed, they might declare success if we get down to something like two and a half, mm -hmm. um, just given their new flexible average inflation um, framework. Um, now, I, I do think there are good reasons to believe that the disinflation we've seen so far has been the easy part, uh, because a lot of the disinflation we've seen has been in uh, the normalization of a lot of the supply chain distortions mm -hmm. we've saw, seen, so in goods inflation. Um, and I do think that it's probably, you know, the second half of this battle is probably going to be the harder one, um, particularly as it relates to, uh, to wage inflation, right? Mm -hmm. And we've seen, and again, we saw last Friday some welcome deceleration in wage inflation, but we still need to see that go further. Um, so I do think uh, <laughs> there is good reason to believe that some of the service inflation we're seeing on the price side, the wage inflation we're seeing, uh, is going to be a little tougher uh, to ring out, which is, I guess, another way to say that, you know, perhaps the Phillips curve is nonlinear, and you know, maybe it may take a little bit more of an increase in unemployment than we've seen. We've only really seen one month of an increase in unemployment, uh, so I do think there's reasons to believe that, you know, we we probably are going to need to see the unemployment rate drift above four percent before we start to see the type of wage inflation declines uh, or deceleration that makes us a little more comfortable that uh, that we can get back to somewhere, again, in the neighborhood of 2%. It's, it's, it's really tough, though, you know, trying to apply, you know, models that we've developed over many <laughs> yeah. decades to the post-pandemic environment, because yeah. what I'm trying to figure out is, yes, wa technically wages now rising, you know, 3, 4, 5 percent year over year is clearly higher than you would think is consistent with 2% inflation, but is that payback for higher inflation that workers have already um, experienced? Mm -hmm. And if, you know, as job openings come down, as labor, as job gains ease off, can workers be persuaded to not ask for such big wage increases going forward? And, and yeah. it, it might, that, might that happen even without a recession or without un unemployment yeah. going above yeah. 4%? Yeah, you know, I think that's, that's interesting, which is, um, Per, all, right, all right, so just to set the stage, we've seen a, you know, a, a not trivial decline in wage inflation without, again, until yeah. last month and any, any increase in unemployment. Why was that the case? Maybe it was the case because this year we've seen headline inflation come off yeah. pretty significantly. So those wage demands, which last year were probably, you know, really fueled by higher gas and, and food prices and other things. This year, maybe those kind of catch up uh, uh, demands are a little less. Yeah. So the real wage bargaining may be um, turning a little more friendly in an in inflation perspective. You know, I guess I, I would add uh, two related points, which is when you think about um, the, the, the linkages between wage and price inflation, there are two sources of slippage. One is productivity growth and the other is profit margins. Yep. I think on both of those, there's some reason for optimism that we can sustain a little bit higher than average wage inflation and still see some decline, further declines in price inflation. So productivity, you know, we're starting to see a little bit of signs of life mm -hmm. there. And then margins are still very high, so there's, there's room to come down yep. and still be at the higher end of the historical range. So I do think, you know, applying a mechanistic uh, uh, rule like we need to have wage inflation at 3.5% or below may be true in the very long run, but uh, I think we could see further declines in inflation with wages, you know, running right now in the low fours or whatever. So, so we're going to obviously be looking at wage growth and really watching this very closely. Um, but so will the Federal Reserve. The Fed used to be very dovish, I thought, <laughs> and then has suddenly turned very hawkish over the last year. So do you think they really are hawkish at heart or, or what, what, what sort of animal are they? What yeah. sort of bird are they, I guess? I think they're situational. And Look, they were dovish when we had a decade of below 2% inflation. There was a lot of worries about Japanification. Um, they had a, uh, a generation high uh, inflation problem and, and they responded accordingly. Um, so I, and I would say it's not just like pretend hawkishness. Look, I think an, a, a, a perhaps the best example of this, in my opinion, is if you go back to um, the March FOMC meeting, mm -hmm. which was uh, about a week after Silicon Valley, uh, all the other banks failed, yeah. and they hiked, right? So they hiked, and it's, if you look back in history, it's pretty rare for the Fed to hike in a 
period of financial stress like, like the one we had in March. So I think that shows you just how and it, committed they are to, to that inflation problem. All right, is, it, is any of this changes in personnel for the Fed? Are, are new, new members more hawkish than, than the old ones? I, I think the new members, the new, certainly the new board members, are probably going to lean uh, a little more dovish. Um, I think there's, you know, general, I don't know if you call it a stereotype or, or generalization that Democratic appointees are going to be a little more dovish. We just, uh, today and yesterday, had the Senate, I think, confirm three, yep. uh, re confirm or reconfirm three governors um, who, you know, in their confirmation hearings, I did think were a little on the dovish side. So, um, so that, you know, and perhaps that's one of the things contributing to this uh, a little more dovish tone we've had out of the Fed over mm -hmm. the past, you know, few months. Speaking of dovish tones, one of the things that seems to have survived um, over the pandemic, the inflation scare, is the Federal Reserve's view of where short-term interest rates ought to be in the long run. And I, yeah. you know, I, I, you know, I've done research. You have too uh, on this. And and in the 50 years before the pandemic, or sorry, before the great financial crisis, the average real federal funds rate was about 2% positive. So the federal funds rate was 2% above the inflation rate. And now they're looking for trying to get 2% inflation in the long run. And they think that the federal funds rate ought to be 2.5% in the long run, which seems like a very low real rate of mm -hmm. half a percent. Um, do you, for, first of all, do you agree with that? And second of all, do you think there's a chance that they may actually move that up? Is, is that what they regard as our star? And yeah. they think our star maybe needs to be nudged up a bit? Yeah, so... Um I guess I would say in their defense, they're probably looking back at the experience of, you know, the first 20 years of this century, which most estimates, certainly in the, the decade after the Great Recession, it, there was a lot of reasons to believe that our star was uh, depressed then. Now, it may have been depressed for reasons that were somewhat cyclical in nature. The and credit sir, was, and yeah. before we go any further, I yeah. mean, our star is the rate of interest which should cause supply and demand of the economy to be balanced and so keep the inflation rate essentially exactly. stable. Yeah, yeah. The, the real inflation rate yeah. that keeps the economy kind of in That's equilibrium. Right. Now, you know, how, how cyclically sensitive is our star, I think, is, mm -hmm. a, is a, uh, a big question because perhaps some of the reasons it was depressed after the GFC, after the Great Recession, was because of credit headwinds. Perhaps now part of the reason it may be, appears to be, feels to be perhaps a little elevated is that this fiscal um, uh, fiscal situation is not only supporting growth, it's also leading to a lot of issuance of government debt. Mm -hmm. um, so it does seem like the, while the median has been at, as you say, 2.5% nominal for several years now, in two weeks uh, when we get the new updated dots, I do think there's a risk here that the median drifts up, if for no other reason than that in that period of stability of the median, we've seen the mean kind of drift up. So it does feel like yeah. that's kind of where they're going. I would also add that some of the econometric models that the Fed looks at, like the ones uh, uh, kept by the Richmond Fed, suggest that our star has been moving higher lately. So in the long run, so the Federal Reserve, in other words, in, in two weeks may well say that, you know, upon further consideration, the rate of interest necessary to keep inflation at 2% might be a bit higher than they thought before. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, the, the other the other star you know, that they think about a little bit is U star. So, what's the unemployment rate, which is consistent with keeping inflation at two percent? Um, yeah. And I, you know, the I think the Fed thinks it's four or has mm -hmm. said that, but it's uh, it's, it's we certainly been seeing unemployment below that. So, where do you think U star is? Yeah. So, uh, I guess maybe just. To back up a little bit. So you're right, the Fed has had it at 4%, or the median participant has had it at 4% for, again, several years now. That being said, I think many of them, and, and ourselves included, believe that uh, certainly in the aftermath of uh, the pandemic, that this was probably elevated uh, for reasons that were likely temporary in nature. Um, and perhaps this is one of the reasons we saw wage and price inflation start to pick up even before we got to 4% unemployment. I do think some of those dislocations and reallocations that are associated with, with this you know, hopefully once in a lifetime event are starting to, to normalize. And I think you see that in the behavior of 
the beverage curve without getting too, too much into you know, technical details here, the relation between job vacancies and unemployment is moving in a direction that suggests that matching job seekers with job openings mm -hmm. has become a little more smooth over the last you know, six to 12 months. Sure. Sure. So, okay, so that's, that's all, a lot of this being about the sort of short-term business cycle, but how does this factor in, I guess, it sort of uh, confuses things in the short run, but yeah. longer term, how fast do you think the U.S. economy can really grow? So, uh, we've had an estimate of around 1.5% yep. for potential, um, potential GDP growth, uh, which embeds uh, an estimate of the growth in the workforce of a little less than a half percent and growth and productivity of a smidge over 1%. Um, as I kind of alluded to earlier, there are some, uh, uh, not to get back to the short run, but short run signals yeah. that some things are looking a little bit more favorable. Um, so on the labor force side, some of these things, again, are probably on the more of a short run thing is that we've seen participation pick up and we've also seen foreign born uh, workforce growth um, pick up. So again, maybe that's something that mm -hmm. fades. However, on the productivity side of things, again, a few hints here that perhaps we um, were getting some better productivity performance. Certainly over the past year, we've seen that, and it looks like the third quarter should be another good productivity mm -hmm. quarter. And so it's a little hard to say, but perhaps we're seeing some of the fruits of um, investment in technology start mm -hmm. to pay off. Obviously, very difficult to tease that out from quarterly numbers that don't give you a lot of granularity. But there are um, reasons to hope. I, re I remember in the late 1990s when we had a, we had a very tight labor market back then. I remember we, I, I used to say that productivity is just another word for having no one left to hire. If you couldn't find if you couldn't find anybody yeah. to work for, then you had to work everybody you you had mm -hmm. smarter, and you ended up with productivity gains. And so maybe we're seeing a little yeah. bit of that with uh, right. so many months of uh, of full employment. Uh, you know, obviously productivity is key here, and one of the questions we've been wrestling with is. Um, there's a lot of hype and a lot of enthusiasm, perhaps is a better word, around AI, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. Does that impact your view of productivity growth in the long run? Do you think productivity growth will be better because of it? Certainly there are a um, uh, number of, I think, pretty good studies out there that suggest uh, AI could have meaningful impacts on productivity growth. Whether we should expect to see it you know, in the near term, I think is a little bit more of um, up for grabs, but certainly, you know, our bank has been investing a lot in AI and we're seeing those investments um, uh, economy wide as well. So I do think uh, as we, you know, as we look at the outlook, it could add certainly a couple tenths to productivity mm -hmm. growth, which, you know, a couple tenths may not sound like um, a lot, but when you compound that over several years, that, that definitely has big sure. impacts for living standards. And, and very important in a, in a world where la you know, labor supply is, is pretty constrained. Yeah, definitely. The demographics long run, um, uh, we are going to need more help in doing things. And if we can get that from AI, I think that would be yeah. a big help. One of the questions we get a lot from our clients and a lot of people are very worried about is the fiscal situation. Mm -hmm. And um, as you mentioned earlier, we have seen that that deficit rise somewhat this year. Uh, what What's your outlook there? I mean, do you think that you know, further continued economic growth and maybe a resumption of student loan payments, can, can that help a little bit? Or do, do we have a very significant deficit problem? We have a significant deficit problem. So the things you mentioned will help. Every little bit is going to help. Uh, the debt deal that uh, arrived, was arrived at earlier in the summer, that will help. Uh, so we will see a modest amount of fiscal contraction, we believe, going into um, the coming fiscal year, mm -hmm. uh, but should still leave deficits running around 5% of GDP uh, with no prospect of that narrowing further as we look several mm -hmm. years out from there. So um, so right now the situation does not look good. We don't see much uh, happening between now and the next election. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond the next election, of course, is anyone's guess. But right now the situation uh, doesn't look favorable, and I think you see that to some degree, re reflected in, in you know, interest rate yeah. markets. You know, right now we've got divided governments, which actually usually actually constrains the deficit a little bit. If we mm -hmm. end up with single party government going, you know, after the next election, the, the dangers are you know, we could see a, a further surge. And yeah, well, it's a very significant deficit. All right, let, let's let's end on something a little 
cheerier and, and near and dear to my own heart, which is the American consumer, because mm -hmm. I've uh, uh, I sort of lived my life in America just in amazement at the Americans' willingness to buy stuff they don't need mm -hmm. with money they don't have. <laughs> uh, so what's, uh, what's your view on the, the state of consumers and how consumers will impact yeah. the economic outlook yeah. going forward? So the state of co uh, consumers we think is good. Uh, it was great if you go back a year or two. Um, some of the really pristine elements we were seeing on consumer balance sheets um, now aren't bad, but they're not quite as good mm -hmm. as, as they were. You see increasing, um, you know, slightly increasing debt to income ratios, things of that nature. Uh, that said, um, we think the outlook remains uh, pretty favorable. It's going to be tough, I think, to beat what we've seen. Certainly in the first, you know, it looks like the first three quarters of the year were very good. I would expect slowing from here. Uh, but even in the event we, um, uh, should we slip into recession, uh, which remains a risk, I think the consumer still probably puts up positive growth numbers because even in mild recessions, mm -hmm. you tend to see that. So overall, um, a few modest headwinds here and there. You mentioned the student debt uh, repayment issue. We think that'll probably, you know, maybe be a little hiccup for spending growth mm -hmm. in the fourth quarter. Um, we do have a depletion of excess saving, which gets a lot of uh, a lot of attention. That said, wealth to income ratios still look pretty good, mm -hmm. and that that holds across most. Uh, demographics as yeah. well. So overall, um, you know, it's going to be, as I said, hard to beat what we've seen in the first part of this year, but I still think the outlook for consumers is yeah. relatively So as adding a little bit of stability to the outlook. Yes, definitely. definitely. All right. Well, listen, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And, and thank you all for listening. Uh, this episode wraps up our Market Movers mini-series. I hope you've enjoyed uh, your summer and the conversations this season has featured. Uh, our next season will begin in October and we will focus on key strategies investors should consider when building portfolios that last. I'll be joined by some of our thought leaders across our alternatives, active ETFs, models and portfolio insights businesses. Other than, thank you all for listening and speak with you soon.